lose is often a hormonal response that happens soon after having a baby where there is dysregulation in the hormones which causes you know tearfulness and sadness and low mood and things but generally that will resolve within a few days postnatal depression is that persistence in low mood and it's off, it's generally um, associated with feelings of hopelessness I think the other thing is um, that it can happen in any time in that first year. Yes. So, um, you know, it's important to talk to people if you're feeling that way. I think sometimes, a lot of the time, we go, oh, I'm just so tired. Because mm. it is tiring having little ones. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people go, oh, it's just, I'm so tired. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Tiredness can feel similar to depression, like there's some similar um, symptoms or how you're feeling. Um, but the tiredness, if you get good sleep, and mm. it's not just one good night's sleep, and we know mm. it's hard, but it's capturing the moments of sleep that you can get, because we know that it's really full on if you're waking up with the baby. But, um, and we know that you can have depression and tiredness as well. So um, a lot of our families that we talk to, or our women that we talk to, talk about this extreme tired, oh, I'm just really, really tired, mm. when actually they're having symptoms of postnatal depression. Yeah. So it's about thinking about that. That's right. And so some of the other symptoms could involve a loss of appetite, a lack of sort of excitement or um, enthusiasm towards eating or towards food, often not being able to sleep even when the baby's sleeping. Mm -hmm. So given the opportunity to get rest, um, perhaps at night once the baby's settled and you've got into bed, but you still lie there awake. And often in those moments you can replay thoughts or feelings or worry. Um, you know, situations over and over in your head, which is really unhelpful, and it also really inhibits good quality sleep. But yeah, that lack of appetite, that um, difficulty with sleeping, and then often a loss of desire and things, um, that, you know, and pleasure, things that you used to find really enjoyable, enjoyable. You know, whether it was cooking, whether it was um, catching up with friends, whether it was going out for walks and um, whatever it might be, but just a lack of pleasure in the things that you normally would enjoy doing. These are some pretty strong indicators that there might be some depression going like on. Finding things that used to be quite normal, really hard to do, like getting up, having a shower. But we know that that's really hard work with a baby anyway, just you know, managing to get, get a shower. But where the feelings of how you're feeling in yourself are preventing you from doing those self-care and those nurturing things, eating, yeah. sleeping, showering, just your normal daily, like wanting to go out, wanting yeah. to go meet up with friends as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can speak from my own situation that um, there were times where things were feeling really difficult and I would become fixated on them in the postnatal period. So I might be struggling a lot um, with my toddler's behaviour, for example, when I had had my new baby. And I was thinking, gosh, my toddler's behaviour is so difficult and so out of control. And But it was actually that I was really struggling on myself, so my capacity to deal with that behaviour had decreased. Mm -hmm. And you might see that manifest in lots of different ways. Um, you might have a whānau member who um, has really fixated on the baby's sleep and is mm -hmm. really struggling. And when you talk to them about the sleep, you think, that kind of just sounds like normal baby sleep. Or it could be about toddler behaviour. It could be about some stressor within um, within their life, financial or the household or otherwise, often these are symptoms of, you know, decreased mental capacity in the mother to deal with some of those more difficult sort of life situations. Could be an indicator of postnatal depression. And I think it's important that family notice. Yeah. <clears throat> so sometimes we find that family go, oh, Gosh, that's exactly how we've been noticing, but the woman hasn't noticed it about herself. Yeah, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Mm. So talking to somebody is so important. You know, finding someone that you trust, that you're comfortable with, and it can be really difficult when you've built a trusting relationship with your LMC or your Plunkett nurse to then step into a place of vulnerability to say how you're thinking and feeling. Um, and so they might not be the right person, but it's just important that you talk to somebody, whether it's your GP, a practice nurse, blanket line, the mental health line, finding somebody that you are comfortable to share your thinking and feeling with, to check in with them and say, you know, is this, is this okay or is this something I need some more support with? And sometimes it's if, if the per first person that you've told hasn't been helpful yes. for you, it's going to somebody else. 
That's right. So, because sometimes your friends can go, oh, no, 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 that's how I that's felt. That's how I felt, and I got over there, that's mine. Yeah, you and know. then you're really struggling inside, mm. and you're feeling like people are just going, oh, no, 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 you're fine. Do go and find people who can really help you, who really, truly, authentically listen to what you have to say, because there's so many people who go, okay, well, let's make it all better, and let's give you lots of advice, and you just want to be listened to. So yeah. find those people who can truly listen to your story. Yeah, and sharing your story and telling your story is incredibly therapeutic. Mm. You know, sometimes that in itself, and then putting some plans and supports in place to build that capacity for you to be a parent, sometimes that's all it takes. Mm. And other times you'll need more intensive intervention, and that's okay too. I think there's a lot of stigma around about... Um, you know, taking that next step, getting a referral mm. for to mental health services, seeing your GP, um, potent, potentially um, accessing medication for depression or for maternal anxiety. But I just really encourage you to talk it over with people who have walked that journey before, that peer collegial support, that's totally invaluable at that time. And I think while we're talking about medication, it's about having, a, some women worry if they're breastfeeding about the um, medication passing through their breast milk. Your GPs are the best people to know, or your nurse practitioner are the best people to know about the right medications that work with breastfeeding. That's right. Um, so, and it's about having a really good talk to them about it because it's it has a chemical reaction that, for some, and it doesn't. It's not an instant. They say it takes a good couple of weeks. So it's having strategies in place if you are having using medication or going on medication. Mm -hmm. It's having strategies and people around you to nurture you in that time while the medication starts to work. Right. Um, but it's about talking to people about it. If you're wondering or you're worried, talk to people. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is those thoughts and worries in your own head might seem small or silly to you, but others want to help. So it's about having those conversations with people. Yeah, and we've talked before about providing people who are your support people, mm -hmm. people in your whanau, with um, things they can do that, that are helpful to you. It might not be coming in and swooping in and taking mm -hmm. the baby away. Um, that's not always the most helpful thing. There might be times where that's required, but on the whole, it might be having someone who can drop off a meal or throw the washing on the line or take the toddler to the park so you've got some time with Pepe. It's about you know, strategies that you can use to increase that capacity for you to be with your baby. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It gives you the opportunity to have the wonderful moments with your baby, the time to have yeah. some breaks and some rest and to nurture yourself and care for yourself. Yeah. Um, people generally usually want to help. So sometimes you go, just let me know what I can help. Thinking of things that would be helpful for you, because as Katrina said, having somebody sleep in and take the baby off you, mm. that might be there your they're your precious peppy that you want to have that nurturing, loving time, but sometimes when they're crying you might want to hand them over to somebody else to give you a bit of a break. It doesn't yeah. mean that you can't settle your baby, it just means that somebody else with a bit more energy at that moment um, has that energy to come and support. Mm. I do um, think also thinking about some of the um, symptoms or the ways that um, depression is experienced. Some people actually get quite ang feel quite angry. Yeah. Um, they might be angry with their partner, or it's affecting their relationship together. Yeah. Um, just being parents it does always impact your. <laughs> quite often, will have an impact on your relationship. There's yeah. some who have joy and it brings them closer together, and there's others with their past parenting experiences, and you come from completely different parenting experiences. Or well, you're both feeling really tired, mm. um, stressed, you've got a baby who cries a lot. So it can affect your relationship, but it also can increase your anxiety or your anger. Yeah, that's right. And I think what's really important is communication. Mm -hmm. You know, partners are incredibly understanding, but when they don't <laughs> understand what's going on and what is, you know, what has been leading to this outburst or this anger or, you know, it's really hard for them to support you in that. And so um, having those conversations, you know, when you get those moments where you have time to have conversations about saying, hey, look, I know that I'm really, my work is really short at the moment. I know that I'm being really short. I'm not angry with you. I'm not trying to be. I'm just trying to manage the best that I can at the moment, you know, and putting some strategies in place around that, you know, I'm getting really frustrated because, you know, the, the dishes are just sitting there and you're 
resting on the couch and you know and that sort of thing so putting some things in place around that hey I'm just going to rest for five minutes and then I'm going to get up and do those dishes you know communication is the key to making things flow so much more smoothly in a relationship and it might be having a word or something that means I need your help now yeah between each of you you know it might be like you know I really mean I need help now not yeah. um, in half an hour or whatever I think the other thing that's really important is to is that men get postnatal depression too so, um, and couples can both have it at the same time. So that's when you really need a lot of support around you to help navigate. Yeah. Um, because that can affect your relationship as well. Um, or you might have other members of your family who's struggling with depression and you're feeling that you've got depression as well. It's about how do you navigate that so that you can get that joy, that, that you can get that time with your PB that you really feel that you've nurtured yourself and looked after yourself. There's the saying, you know, the mothers or the fathers who care for themselves um, have got that capacity, yeah. filled their own cups up. That's it, and you can't pour from an empty mm -hmm. cup. Mm -hmm. And that's that's absolutely true. Um, so we've talked a lot about depression. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most commonly spoken about um, struggle with our mental health in the postnatal in the postnatal period. But let's take a moment, a few moments, to talk about anxiety. Mm -hmm because it's something that's becoming increasingly more common um, and it's something that you might not even be asked about in the postnatal period and because there's not a huge amount of information about there out there it might not be something you recognize in yourself either so what might maternal anxiety look like um i think uh, antenatally too so True. antenatal anxiety worry constant worry about things now Normal anxiety, being anxious or a little bit stressed is normal. That's our automatic, inbuilt biological response. Um, keeps us safe. Keeps us safe. <laughs> yeah. um, and also being a little bit anxious about our babies or a little bit stressed actually helps us to meet their needs because yeah. we're like, oh, I wonder what they're needing now. Oh, I'm just wondering. So, so um, it just helps us care, but it's when it becomes a problem. So it's when you get these overwhelming thoughts, these overwhelming feelings. It's almost like you're, um, in, we call it fight flight. It's a bit like my heart's going a bit faster, my breathing's a bit, I'm a little bit tense, mm. shoulders are up. You know, it's that body feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everybody will feel it in different ways, but it's about you being aware. It's about that self-awareness about when I am anxious, this is how I feel. Mm. As Katrina said before, lying awake worrying about things, worrying constantly about things, worrying that our baby's going to get, like, of course we worry that something's going to happen to them, but it's that overwhelming anxiety that something terrible is about to happen. Um, or concerned that we're not doing a good enough job. Like, constantly worrying, I'm anxious, I'm not doing a good enough job, I'm not a good enough mother. I've got this whole list of things that I'm constantly worrying about. Comparing yourself yeah. against other people. Yeah. Mm. It's a really common thing um, that's experienced postnatally. And I think if every, you know, if you're in a close enough antenatal group or PDP group or um, group of friends who are walking in a similar journey, they will all say that they are all walking through this journey. Mm. You know, in the mm. same way, they all have worries. They all have fears. I saw a great meme this morning on Facebook, and it said, "I can only do one thing." Either the house will look good, the kids or me, you know, and I just thought that's so true, you know, yeah. and it's, you, it's, you can't be a perfect parent. There is no such thing as perfect parenting. In the circle of security, their um, motto is good enough, is good enough parenting. And that's actually just talking about circle of security. Is there some really great um, animated clips? Little animated clips. So you Google circle of security and animations. Um, and you'll come up, there's three. So one of them talks about the circle. So it talks about you know, letting your babies go out and explore. You know, it might be just exploring, just looking around. They might be exploring, just, you know, having a bit of an experience, touching and doing things. But they come back. So they, it's likened to being like a flower. They'll go out a little bit and explore and they'll come back. Now, when they're tiny, they don't physically go out and explore, so it might be that they're just having a little bit of time looking around, or they might be just having a bit of a look around in their bed, wherever they are, having a bit of a sleep, they've woken up and they're having a bit of a look around, exploring the world. And then they start to cry and they start to need their person to fill their cup up again, so that's bringing them back to you. 
Now, sometimes when you're not feeling very well in yourself, um, or you're anxious, you might be worried about what's going to happen if this, or you're feeling like I don't have that much, that much emotional to give to look after myself, let alone to care for them as best as I can. So it can be then you start second guessing yourself. I think mm, yeah. that's right, and so you might miss the baby's cues, and this is quite common um, that we see with mm. women who are experiencing difficulties with their mental health postnatally and antenatally. Um, in a different way, but you might see the baby will be queuing for something quite obvious. You know, this baby is really hungry, and they're looking, you know, looking for the food and looking for the food, and the mum's just not seeing it because they just, they just can't see it in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so it's about having the people around that can say instead of going, oh look, the baby's obviously hungry, having someone who can gently say, hey, I wonder if it's that the baby's hungry. You know, I can't think of how many times out in practice as a Plunkett nurse I've said to mums. I'm wondering if the baby's tired. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if this baby needs... And the, the mum might think the baby's queuing for food and actually this baby is very tired and is trying to queue to go to sleep. So if you're noticing in yourself that um, your mood is dysregulated, you're feeling flat, you're feeling... Just be aware that you might not be as... Uh, the cues might not be as obvious to you. So be really mindful about looking and thinking, you know, just watching your baby, pausing and thinking, what is my baby trying to tell me? And like Anne said, where is my baby on the circle? Are they going out and exploring? In which case they want me to watch over them and delight in them. And, or are they wanting to come back in and get comfort and support? And I'm, you know, oh, I'm, oh, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to, I want, you know, I'm trying to quickly do this. I want to get the house perfect or, or whatever it might be. So it's thinking, where is my baby on the circle? What do they need from me in this moment? And how can I meet that need in a way that's realistic for what I can do at the moment? And I think, particularly if you're anxious, I think your brain gets so busy that actually stopping, pausing. Mm. And we say just give a bit more of a pause, just so that you can actually go, oh, I'm wondering what you're trying to tell me at the moment. What is it? Now, we don't get it right all the time. Of course not. I think they say that we get it around 30 or 40% of the time. We're somewhere we're mismatching with our babies. They're queuing us for something and we're misreading them a bit. Or we're trying to repair. And that's actually really important. The rupture and repair, where we make it better for our children, mm. um, helps them learn about rupture and repair. So please, the biggest thing is don't expect so much of yourself. No. Please, please, please don't expect to be the perfect parent because I think if we expect ourselves to be perfect parents, we actually end up doing more harm to ourselves and our children because yeah. the world's not perfect. We're not perfect, we make mistakes. Yeah. It's about how we make it better, that is the important thing. Absolutely. And that helps us, it helps our children, it takes less pressure off us because when you're trying to be perfect all the time, your expectations of yourself gets higher and higher and higher and then you start to make more and more things start going wrong and then you're more and more cr critical of yourself. So it's about, okay, I didn't do that so well. <laughs> yeah. That didn't go so well today. Yeah. It will be better. Yeah. yeah. And verbalising it can be really useful, you know, and it, and, and it sounds silly, but it's also, it's really good for you and your mental health to hear yourself speaking it out loud like, mm. Mummy's really sorry, she got that wrong, I thought that you were ready to go to bed, but you're obviously still hungry. You know, come on, come have a cuddle with Mummy and we'll give you a little bit more milk before bed. You know, it, it, those that sort of communication is, that's the repair that Anne's talking about. Like, oh, I got it wrong, but, you know, we can make it better. And that's really important, because like Anne said, kids learn how to repair, you know, when there is a, a trauma or an upset in their life from us. You know, they learn that from their circumstances around the way that we have dealt with stress and we've dealt with that rupture and repair. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important um, and is incredibly difficult to remember when you are in it is that how you are feeling is temporary. Mm -hmm. You know, this, mm -hmm. this stage of life that you're going through, the intensity, particularly in the antenatal and early postnatal months, the intensity is so, so intense but it is also so temporary. And anyone with old, older children will be able to say that to you, like, oh my gosh, you know, you don't know how you get through it, but you look back and it's already gone. You know, and so it's about holding on to those joyful moments. You know, regardless of how you are in yourself, regardless how your mental health is, you're not going to get that time back. So it's about, you know, noticing and capturing and holding on to the joyful moments with your baby. 
And I think that's a really important thing is creating joy moments. Yeah. So it might be um, just thinking, right, I'm just going to sit, sit and watch my baby for the moment. And just absorbing those smiles yeah. or the giggles or the just them being calm and happy mm. um, and not crying. <laughs> mm. You know, just take those moments and think, wow, I did this. You know, so it's about finding those moments which are hard when you're feeling depressed. Yeah. So it's starting with little moments of joy because finding joy, doing things like very simple things like massaging mm. your baby, mm. seeing them calm, skin to skin, skin, to skin to showering together or bathing <clears throat> together if that's comfortable for you. Mm. Yeah. And if you're feeling that you're not having a lot of joy moments, it's about thinking and talking to others about how you can have those joy moments. So thinking about how am I going to get my mental health well enough so that I can have these. Yeah. Um, and it might be at that time that somebody else is having some of those joy moments with your baby or your toddler or your preschooler. It's about that's joyful for them. Yeah. So it's about thinking, I'll get those moments too. Yeah. It's about making those moments or sitting and thinking, right, well, I can do, you know, having little moments of joy. It might be reading to them, it might be touching their hand, it might be massaging them. It might be them. taking them out for a walk. It yeah. might, you know, it, it's about what fills your cup too. Mm. Because like we were saying before, you can't pour from an empty cup. And, um, and sometimes it's really important because of brain development. We know that, you know, babies' brains grow from their communication and their... Um, their contact and interaction with us through their experiences. So if you're not in a place where you feel like you can give a lot of this, they need to be getting that from somebody else for a little bit of time. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But how are we going to increase your capacity so that you can step back into that position that you can be that baby's person again soon? And I think, I mean, that was a really good point before about getting out and about too. Yeah. Some of the really good, in the you know, sometimes we hear people just say, need more, you know, get more exercise, exercise get more yeah. sleep, eat well. Actually, they are a reason. You have to think that those moments are you nurturing your body yeah. so that you can care for yourself and you can care for your your tamariki. So you might, and I think, when, particularly if you've got depression or anxiety when you've got other kids as well, when you just don't have just a baby, that can add extra complexity. When you've got your first baby, there's the extra complexity because you haven't done it before. So you've got all that stuff. So everybody's story is different. So yeah. don't judge yourself. Your story is your story. But it's doing things that nurture yourself. So it's about absolutely sleep. It's one of the most mm. important things that you can do. And if you've got a baby who wait, is waking up a lot at night time, it's thinking, how can I capture enough sleep? Because sleep exhaustion is torture. Really, that overtiredness, so that adds to how you're feeling. Of course. Exercise, getting out and getting your body moving mm. is really important. Mm. It gets all your body's hormones going. Mm. Um, and eating really well is really important too because that nurtures your body. Yeah. Now, um, it's about fluid as well. You know, they, they seem quite basic things, but they are the priority. We, we worry about doing it for our children, so we need to worry about doing it for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, one of the things is screen time too. It's about, you know, having, I know we love just, it's a bit of an escape when you've got your phone or a computer or something. It's about putting that aside before you go to bed. Because mm. they say we should ideally have half an hour, I think, before we go to bed when we don't have screen time. So that's just you preparing yourself, having nurturing showers, doing those sort of things that actually nurture yourself so that you can nurture your wee ones. If you're feeling that you're getting really stressed and anxious, it's about what ways can you do that works for you that reduces that. Now, everybody's different. Absolutely. So that could be mindfulness. It could be treating yourself. You know, I remember early in the postnatal period having stashes of little treats <laughs> that were just for me. You know, having a bath. You know, that really luxurious feeling of just some time where somebody else is looking after the kids and you've got some time just to be and just mm. to rest. It could be exercise. It could be catching up with friends. You know, really social people can struggle in the postnatal period, in the antenatal period, when um, they're not able to be as social as they'd like to be. 
So we've been talking quite a bit about um, how we can look after ourselves, and I just wanted to wrap up by emphasizing the importance of the relationship, mm -hmm. the parental relationship, and how the strength of the parental relationship is, um, is incredibly important, not only for mental health, but for the development um, and, and joy of your children. So what are some strategies how you can um, you know, promote a healthy relationship um, over this really precious time of life? I think communication is the key. Yeah. Um, and you may have some people that you talk to and some that you don't about these sort of things. Find the people that you can talk to. Who are the people that can hold what you have to say? Um, and don't pass you the tissue box to, there, 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 it's all right. You want to have people that you can actually truly tell how you're feeling. Deep mm. inside here, your true inner stuff. Mm. Um, now that might be, might be a partner, it might be a friend, it might be an auntie, it might be your mum. The other thing is asking other people how they're feeling. So um, if it's your partner, how are they feeling? I think the other thing is too is that we are a village. We should be supporting each other. A million to one, if you have groups or you have other people that are your support people and they've got little people, they may well be feeling like this too. So um, you might not be experienced depression, stress or anxiety. Think about your friends who might be. Be open, be the one that's there to nurture and care for others. Mm. But we quite often find that people who have similar experiences find it helpful to talk to somebody who has similar experiences. So find through your networks, talk to your tamariki or a provider, your nurse, your kaifani, your health worker, plunket line, they will help you connect with the people in your community who can help. Now different areas have different services so we're not going to run through what they all are. There's always your GP, there's your practice nurse, there's your nurse practitioner, um, mental health mental line, mental health line. Where you can text or call um, any time, day or night, and we'll put the contact information for that um, at the end of this chat. And it's not about just talking to them once. It might be yeah. that they help you with that initial stuff. You might have counselling services. It might be a support group. It might be that you just want to do your own stuff with your whanau. Um But you can ring Plunket Line. You might be on a path, on a journey to feeling better. Mm. But you're trying to make some decisions about something that's starting to get you anxious again. Bring them up, have a chat. That's what they're there for, to help you with the parenting, to yeah. help you make some of those decisions. Because when you're feeling depressed or anxious or stressed, it can be harder to make decisions. Mm. So I think the other thing is when you're stressed, it's about calming yourself. So because when we get stressed, we go into our lower brain stem. We think, fight, fight, make decisions that we're not so sure about. Um, calming ourselves helps us to think about things a bit more rationally. So yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, we've just got one question that's come through. We talked about relationships, um, also about if you're doubting yourself. You know that I think um, we always doubt ourselves as parents. Yeah. Um, I know I've got two. I always have, you know, wondered about am I doing the right thing? What's happening? Have I made the right decision? It's about being kind to yourself. Absolutely. We can't change the past, what we can, we can repair things that haven't gone so well. Mm. And it's about saying today is a new day, today is a new step. Today is a day that I care for myself, I care for my pithi, I care for my tamariki, I care for my people around me. Mm. Um, and I find joy. We really want you to delight and um, enjoy your tamariki. Absolutely. And just like Anne said, every day is a new day. You know, your mental health is always on a continuum mm -hmm. and you know there'll be good days and there'll be not so good days and that's okay you know tomorrow will be a new day yeah i think that's really important we always expect ourselves to be happy but sometimes we're not always happy yeah. no, and that's it's okay about getting help awesome Alrighty. hey thanks so much for joining us this afternoon we've had a really lovely time with you um, and we hope this has been useful i realize that this discussion is the tip of the iceberg and for many of you who are feeling um, flat, who are feeling depressed or anxious um, currently, uh, we hope that this conversation has given you, um, you know, a little nudge into thinking that you were worth getting help for. Some of my greatest regrets as a Plunkett nurse have been talking to women, um, you know, several months after mm -hmm. the fact who have said, gosh, I wish I had got help earlier on.
you know, because actually there is amazing help that can be put in place and survival should not be the objective of parenthood. There should be joy every day, not all day, <laughs> but every day. Alrighty. And so. authentic help. So yeah. please remember Plunkett Line, I'm at 100 Awesome. Ka kitsi.